Our main objective today is just going to be to solve polynomial equations. Okay, we're going to use factoring to do that. So it's going to carry along with our last lesson. Now, I'm going to put some simple rules down, and we just spoke about this a moment ago. But when solving a polynomial equation, ask the question, what values of the variable make the statement true? Okay, and when we set it equal to zero, we'll remember that, oh, what makes this true is when we have one of these equal to zero. So let's write down three steps. Step one, okay, step one is to move everything over to one side of the equation. Move all terms over to one side of the equation. Move all terms over to one side of the equation. Step two. Sorry, so again, step one, I see you're still writing. Move all terms over to one side of the equation. Step two, factor that side of the equation. Factor that side of the equation. And then step three is to set each factor equal to zero. Set each factor equal to zero. Okay, set each factor equal to zero. And you could write this as step four at the end of step three either way, but and solve. Solve each of those mini equations you get. Because you're going to get a few different equations based on the amount of factors you have. Okay, solve each of those mini equations. Does anybody know what we call, besides the word solution, you say the solution to the equation is what you get for x, right? So if you had like 2x plus 1 equals 8, the answer x equals whatever it is, is the solution. There's another term that starts with an r. Anybody know what it is before I give it, or before I talk about it? It's called the blank of the equation. Okay, it's called the root. So let's jot that down. When you, solve, when you solve these equations, the answer is called the root of the equation. The solution is a good word also, but you're going to hear the word root a lot. Okay, so let's just jot that down so we're familiar with it. So another word for the solution of an equation is the root. The root of an equation. Okay, just some vocab that we should know. All right, let's take a look at the first example to see how we can implement these three steps. And you're going to notice after a while that you don't have to really go back to your steps every time. It should be second in nature just to go through this process. This one here, we've got x squared minus 2x equals 15. We can clearly see that we can't solve this just by the way it is now. So step one says to move everything over to one side. So what's easier to do? What is it? Subtract 15 because we want x squared to be positive, right? Remember that? We talked about that. We want whatever the squared term is to have a positive coefficient. So bring the 15 over first. Subtract 15, please. So we're going to have x squared minus 2x minus 15. Now, what does that equal when I subtract 15? Yeah. Don't forget it equals 0. And the common mistake is people put a 1. We're not dividing by 15, but we're subtracting 15. And now we've got something that looks like what we just talked about a moment ago, where we set an expression equal to 0. So this is what we've got. What was the second step? What should we do next? Factor. 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 And Liam, when I factor this, do you know what I get when I factor this? Um, Just tell me what the uh, multiple or the factor. Uh, uh, what did you say? I put you on the spot there. How about give me the factors of 15? 3 and 5. 3 and 5. And 3 and 5 can give you 2, right? So it's definitely going to be 3 and 5. Now it's a matter of, I want it to be a negative in the middle, so... Plus 3 minus 5. Very good. So to see that, again, we know 5 and 3 are the things that are going to multiply to 15 and give us 2, but I want it to be a negative 2, so the negative goes with the 5 to overpower the 3. And that's still equal to 0. Okay? And step 3, what does step 3 tell us to do? And why do we do it? Set both factors to 0. Okay, so I can do something like this, right? What do I call this? Everybody ever hear the term t-chart? Doesn't matter. It just looks like the letter t. So you hear me say make a t-chart. So make a t-chart, and wherever you have a 
multiplication symbol, put a vertical line. So if there were three factors here, you would have another vertical line, you'd have three columns. So the amount of factors is indicative of the amount of columns, and as a result, the amount of roots we're going to have as well. So if I have these two equations now, the last step was to solve them. So go ahead and solve them individually. How do I solve x minus 5 equals 0? You add 5. You add 5. So what do you notice, Worth? It's just going to be the... Yeah, but the answer is opposite of the factor, right? See, the factor was x minus 5. We can see that the sign is opposite now. This is always going to happen when there's a coefficient of 1 in front of the x. If this had been 2x minus 5, you'd have to add the 5 and divide by 2. Okay, so again, you're always solving, but you'll pick up on the pattern that it's always going to be the opposite when the coefficient of x is 1. And what about the left-hand side? What's the answer? x equals? Yeah, negative 3. So how many answers do I have to this problem? And what do you notice? What's the highest degree of the problem? Well, who's forgetting their terminology? Degree means the highest? The highest, like, exponent. So what is it? Two. Yeah, look at the original. It's x squared, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we have two answers. You think that's just a coincidence? So if I had x to the third power, there's going to be three answers. x to the fourth power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And we'll talk about sometimes where there's no what are called real answers. And we'll discuss what that means. But again, the idea here is that we get it so that we have an expression on one side. We factor that expression. We set each of those factors equal to zero and solve the resulting polynomial. Okay, so our roots are going to be negative 3 and 5. In solution set form, here's what this looks like. You just write it like this. X equals, what was this called again? Brace, negative 3, comma, 5. This is not a coordinate. Again, the braces indicate that it is not a coordinate. It is not a coordinate. Traditionally, right from lower to higher number, it doesn't really matter. Okay? It makes no difference. So if you wrote 5 and then negative 3, it's the same answer. Any questions on the first example? All right. The second example is a little tougher because we're going to have to use AC method, and I purposely made this so we can just review it real quick. So let's go ahead and see that. So we have negative 3r squared equals negative 10r minus 8. What do you suppose we do to start this one? What should we do to start this one this time? Summer? Yeah, add the 3r squared over. And I should still list it in the correct order, okay, in the right order here. And clearly we're going to see that we can go right to AC method, or we can try this by trial and error. I mean, you could just try this out, because it's got to be 3R and R. But the ending points could be, you know, 4 and 2, 1 and 8. It, it's going to be a little messy. So I would use AC method. How do I use AC method again? Who wants to send me through this? What do I do for AC method? Somebody who has an answer so far today. What do I do for AC method? You want to give me at least the beginning. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, Okay. Yeah, that's right. And then multiply A and C. Okay. So what's AC turn out to be in this? 24. Negative 24. That's all right. Now this is tricky because negative 24 has a lot of factors, doesn't it? Yeah. So let's start by listing those factors. And let's, let's pause for a second. So as you're listing the factors, you can add them up and see if they come out to the middle term. Okay, so again, as you list them, you can check so you don't have to list them all. So we'll see clearly that these don't give us negative 10. Um, negative 12 or 2. And we can stop there, can we? Yeah. So as, as Hannah's listing them, we could have done 4 and 6, but it would be negative 4 and positive 6. Those won't give us 10. It's very misleading. Because when you hear 4 and 6, what do you think right away? You think 10. But they're opposite signs. So a negative 6 and a positive 4 actually gives you negative 2, not 10. So we'll stop here because negative 12 and 2 is negative 10. What do I do at this point? Liam, you asked the question earlier about AC method. Once I get these two values, these are my answers for AC method. What do I actually do with them? Think back to what we did. Separating the 10R into two different terms. Very good. So what does it look like? Read me, read me what the equation would be. Um, 
3 r squared minus 12 r plus 2 r oh, plus 2 r minus 8. Well done. Very good. And now, what's the next step after this? Because I've got these four terms. Whenever you see four terms, what do you think to do, Ida? Yeah, we think of grouping. Think of splitting it. And when it's split, what is my GCF going to be on the left-hand side of the split? On the left-hand side, Arthur. 4R or 3R. 3R. Well, the 4 is what's left over, right? Mm -hmm. Leaving behind R minus 4. And then what about the right-hand side? Yeah, good. Leaving also R minus 4. And let's indicate the positive 2. So clearly we have a common denominator, r minus 4, r minus 4. Let's go ahead and factor that out in front. And I said common denominator, I mean a common term, sorry. So r minus 4 is in both of those terms. What's left behind is 3r plus 2. So there's my factors. Well, I need to remember that this was not an expression to start. It was an equation. So don't forget your equals 0. And it doesn't matter where I put it. The zero was on the left-hand side earlier. It makes no difference. I'm just going to put equal zero on the right-hand side. There's no effect on the problem, which, whether I put the zero on either side. Okay? What do I do now? What's my last step here? What's my last step worth? You set them equal to zero. Yeah, because again, either of these could be zero. Whenever a product equals zero, any of the factors could be zero. So r minus 4 equals zero. That's an easy one. r equals 4. But then this one, we have to do a little bit of work. Okay, Summer, what do I get? Negative two-thirds. So sum are subtracted to two and then divided by three. So our answers are four and negative two-thirds. How do I know I'm right? How do I know I'm right, Dave? Plug it back in, you'll get the same answer. Yeah, plug it back in the original. Plug it back in the original problem, okay? Remember the original, not a step along the way. So take a look. I'm going to scroll back up. You would be talking about plugging it up here, and that looks confusing at first. You don't plug it in here because if you made a mistake from here down to here, your check might come out to be true when indeed it's false. So if you made a mistake from here to here, you'll get the right answer by, by plugging it in here because you made the mistake right here. So be careful of making a mistake along the way and then checking in the mistake. So you always go back to the original to check your answer. So check it up top here. Okay? And both of them would indeed work in this problem. So what would my solution set look like if I wrote it in solution set form? Good. So brace. Brace, negative two-thirds, comma, four, and then close brace. Okay? How about example three? Example three on your own, please. Go ahead and take a look at this one out on your own. I'll pause while you're working. Okay, so yeah, again, when we factor this, we'll end up getting x minus 5, x minus 5. Liam Clark, what is this called when we get the same answer twice? A double root. Let's write that down just so we know. And there is a significance of that. Okay, it's a double root, it's called. So yeah, your answer is going to look like this. You're just simply going to list 5. It's only one answer in solution set form, but this is called a double root. Now, this is something that you don't need to know this year, but it is good to know in the back of your, you know, keep in the back of your mind. On a, on a graph, on a graph, a double root appears as what's called a tangent. Have you Ew. ever heard of a tangent before? Yeah, you like go off on a tangent. Yeah, I do that a lot, but that's not it. No. <laughs> not that kind of tangent, different tangent. So let's, let's, you know what? Pause on that. Let's wait until the later examples and we'll talk back again what the tangent means because it's a little, it's insignificant right now because we haven't discussed, but we'll discuss it in a moment when we get to examples five, six, seven, and eight. Okay? So let's jump to four for now. It's a double root though, double root. So example four looks complicated, right? Looks like there's a little bit more to do here. What do you recommend we do to start example four? Distribute. Okay, distribute. That works for me. Why would you distribute? Why would you distribute? So you could, um, you could then add things and subtract things. 
Yeah, so you can move everything over to one side. Okay, so let's go ahead and distribute that and then we'll move stuff over. So we're gonna have 3x squared still, or 3x cubed rather, equals 8x squared minus 4x. And then we gotta move those over. Okay. So again, we distributed to start the problem and then moved over the 8x squared and the 4x. All right, now at this point in time, what do I do to make this problem easier on me? Yeah, there's a GCF in this problem. What is it worth? It's just x. And now we have, again, a quadratic. But we still need to factor that quadratic. How do we factor that quadratic? What method should we use here? Oh, well, we could always use the quadratic formula, but we haven't gotten into that yet. But just factoring, how do we factor? Remember, the quadratic formula jumps right to the solution. And we haven't done that yet. What would I do to factor this? AC. Yeah, you can use AC method again. Now, if you wanted to try numbers out, you can try them out, because 3x if x squared is easier to try things out. The 4 here at the end means it could be 2 and 2. It could be 1 and 4. It might be a little bit confusing. So if we list AC to start this, AC is going to be 12. The factors of 12 are 12 and 1. And negative 12 and negative 1. Well, that doesn't give me 8, or negative 8, rather. So I keep going. What about 6 and 2? Does 6 and 2 work? No, no. Negative 6 and negative 2. Yeah, that's what works. Very good. So we want to use these right here. Because negative 6 and negative 2 add up to the negative 8 in the middle. So we remember to break up that negative 8 in the middle into its terms, which are negative 6x and negative 2x. And then carry everything else down. Give you positive 12 when multiplied. But when you add them together, you keep it as a negative, right? Because you're adding the two negatives there. So we break up that middle term. And at this point in time, we can simply put a little dashed line down the middle and go about solving this using AC method. So that x on the outside, please don't forget about it. Okay, don't ignore that x that you factored out in the beginning. We have to talk about what that means. So factoring by grouping, if I take out my GCF in the beginning there, it's going to be a 3x, leaving behind x minus 2. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. Again, for now, ignore the x, but carry it down. Looking at grouping, looking at grouping here, what's left behind is x minus 2. This x minus 2 is left behind here. So what should there be over here? X minus 2. But it's not obvious what you have to factor out unless you write it first. So it might be useful sometimes to do this. To write the x minus 2 first. Okay, and then see what do you have to factor out to get x minus 2. How did you get positive 3? How did I get a positive 4? Okay, so Oh, okay. Add it to the left-hand side? Okay. That's all right. So back to the question. To get x minus 2 here, what do you have to take out of this negative 2x plus 4? Negative 2. Okay? And that's not obvious right away. A lot of people will take out a 2 and not a negative 2. And if you took out just a 2, you would end up with negative x plus 2, which is the opposite of what we want. So we simply take out a negative 2 instead. Okay, so again, the key here is to remember that you need to get the same factor appearing. And now we can factor that by grouping. So x minus 2 is my common factor, leaving behind 3x minus 2. Again, these are common factors. I just underlined them so you can see. We bring that out in front, leaving 3x minus 2. This x in the front has no effect on the problem until the end. Is that clear? The x in the front, just keep carrying it down. It's not affecting the problem. Treat it as if it's not there the whole time. Cover it up, but make sure you still write it down at the end. Because now, how many factors do I have? Three factors. And what did you notice? The original was x cubed, wasn't it? So three factors and therefore three answers or roots, right? There's going to be three roots here 
because there are three factors. So I need to make a T-chart, but I need to separate every factor like this. Remember, put a vertical line wherever there's a multiplication sign. So I see that there are three parts to this. This factor set equal to zero can be solved. This factor set equal to zero can be solved. And this factor set equal to zero is already solved. There's nothing to do there. So what can we make as a conclusion about this x? What does it do to the problem? Whenever you have an x out in front, one of your solutions will always be zero. zero. Again, if there's an x out in front, you're going to set that factor equal to zero, therefore telling you that x equals zero is indeed one of your solutions. Okay, let's write down our answers and then we'll make that conclusion again because it really is important. So our solution set will look like the following. Okay, noticing that there are three solutions or three roots because the original equation was x to the third. It was x to the third. So here's the statement you want to make. When a GCF, when a GCF of x is pulled out, or even if you pulled out like a 2x, it would say your 2x equals 0, therefore x still equals 0. When x is pulled out as a GCF, one of your roots will be 0. One of your roots will be 0. This is one of the most common mistakes. Students pull out the x in front and then ignore it, the rest of the problem. Or they get to this point here and they say, well, let me just divide by x to get rid of it. No, you can't divide by x here. Okay? You have to leave it out front and set it equal to 0 to realize that it is indeed a third root. Okay, it is a third root. Any questions on this problem? It's a little bit more complicated than the other ones were, but we're doing the same thing we did in section 4.6 and in 4.5. Okay, and in 4... Whatever the other one was, I think we started with three. Okay, since we've been factoring. It's all factoring. That's how important factoring is. When you get to calc and pre-calc, you're going to be doing so much factoring, it's unreal. Okay, you really will be doing a lot of it, especially with quadratic and cubic polynomials. They occur a lot. A lot of things follow those patterns. Projectiles in the air follow quadratic polynomials. Okay, so you'll see that occurring a lot in physics. So you have to have factoring down pat, and you're going to see its applications. These three answers, again, we're calling the roots. So there are three roots to this problem. There are three roots. All right, so I'm going to pause here. I'm going to pause here and assign you part of your homework tonight. There's still four more examples I want to do, but they're with a different twist to them. So I'm going to stop here and just give you a small assignment for homework. Let me just see someone's textbook real quick. Thanks, guys. So here's what I'd like you to do tonight. And please write this down, okay? Please write this down, because your homework from 4.7 is multiple problems, but I want to give you the ones that we've covered, the ideas that we've covered. So, let's see. The first part of the homework is 3 through 27, multiples of 3. You can do all of those. 3 through 27 multiples of 3. Um, and then we'll leave the other half for tomorrow night. Okay, we can leave the other half for tomorrow night just to split it up. So tomorrow we'll go on with a little more of this. So leave the other half for tomorrow night. If you want to, you can start and get a head start. But once you get down to like numbers 45, we haven't gone over that yet. So you can still do 29 through 45 odd if you want, if you have time. Okay, or you can get a good head start on your problem sets. Please keep in mind due dates for stuff. Okay. Is your next test on Monday? Yes. Then they're, yeah, then they do on Friday. Do we have class on Friday this week? I have a feeling we have a day off again before a test. So keep that in mind. Yeah. So a lot of you really bombed on that handing in the problem set when we didn't have class. You need to make sure you do it this time and not be late. The thing we're going to look at now is something that is related to the roots of a function or the roots of an equation we've been talking about. But now we're going to look at functions. Now, when we look at functions and we want to figure out what makes the function equal to zero, we call that the zeros of the function. And let me give you an example first. If I had a function, any function, h of x equals x plus 4. 
Okay? This is what we've been talking about with functions in the past already. What would cause this to be equal to zero? What would make this function equal to zero? So yeah, Arthur, negative four. If I plugged in negative four for x, it would be negative four plus four, which is zero. Now, that means that x equals negative four is called a zero of the function. A zero of the function. It makes the function equal to zero. It's the same thing as finding the roots of an equation, really. It's doing this. It's saying, set this equal to zero and just go ahead and solve. Again, the zero of a function is the same thing as the root of an equation. They're different terminology, though. So whenever you have an equation and you're solving it, you're finding the solution or the roots of the equation. But when you find the value that makes a function equal to zero, we call it the zero of the function, which is pretty nice because the zero of a function causes it to be zero. So the name of it is actually in the definition. Okay? Now, what does this mean mathematically? Well, here's what we have. Draw yourself a quick sketch. And if I were to draw this function, it would look like the following. Okay, that's what this looks like. Just draw an estimate of what I drew. You don't have to draw it to be exact. Now, see where it crosses right here on the x-axis? Well, that's negative 4 for x. So the 0 of the function is also the... What is it? X-intercepts. Okay, so let's put that in parentheses here. It's the x-intercepts. That's what the 0 of a function is. Again, it's because the coordinate is negative 4, comma, 0, comma, 0. All right? So we're going to solve these the same way we solved equations when we looked for roots. But now we're going to say to ourselves, well, we're going to call it the 0 of a function and say, what is the x-intercept? So let's look at the next example just to see what we're talking about. Or before the next example, yeah, before the next example, let me look at something a little simpler because the next one's a little complex. I want to make sure we get the idea. So if we had something that was quadratic in nature, well, let's even go cubic. Let's go cubic. x cubed plus 7x squared minus 18x. Okay? And we wanted to find out what the x-intercepts of this function are or the zeros of the function are. When you find the x-intercepts, what do you need to set equal to? What do you have to set something equal to when you find the x-intercepts? Yeah, set y equal to 0. So let's go ahead and set f of x, or y, equal to 0. And right away we'll notice that this is the same exact thing we did yesterday. We're just looking for the roots of this equation now. So again, this was our function we started with. We're trying to find the x-intercepts of that function. To find the x-intercepts, you set x, well, you set f of x or y equal to zero here. And then we can go ahead and just factor. What's your GCF? Good. What does this factor into? What numbers multiply to negative 18 and add up to 7? Good. Which is which? Very good. Okay, let's make sure we carry our signs down, people. Okay, so that's what we get as our factors, x, x plus 9, x minus 2. Again, how do you check that this is right? 9 times negative 2 is negative 18, 9 plus negative 2 is positive 7 in the middle. Um, can we use the AC method? You could always use AC method, but whenever you have something that doesn't have a 1 in the front here, it's a much shorter way to do it by just picking these numbers. Because AC method, you end up picking these numbers anyway, don't you? Yeah. And that's what you're going to end up getting. So AC method is an extra step. So it's not useful when you don't have something here that's not a 1. Okay. So you could go through the first step of AC method and say AC is negative 18, B is 7. What adds up to uh, 7 and multiplies to negative 18? You get those numbers, and then you would go ahead and split it, but don't go ahead and split it. Just make those your factors. Okay? So at this point, if we solve, we have three different solutions here. And these are solutions to the equation or zeros of the function. So this becomes x equals zero. Ladies, whatever it is that you're all giggling about for the last few minutes now, you need to relax, please. 
I'm very observant. I just don't call it out. So please, figure out what it is and laugh a minute and get rid of it. So, x equals 0 is the first root. x equals negative 9 is the second root. x equals 2 is the third root. Of this equation, of this equation, those are the roots. Therefore, they are the zeros of the function. Again, the roots of the equation are the zeros of the function. And if you went and tried any of these three numbers, go up to the top here and do, say, f of 2. Okay, plug in f of 2. You get 2 cubed, which is 8, plus 7 times 4, which is 28, minus 36. 8 plus 28 is 36, minus 36 is 0. So again, the coordinate 2 results in a y value of 0. That's what we've been trying to find out. What are the x values that give you 0 for y? These are the three values. And if you plug any of these three values in, if you do f of 0, if you do f of negative 9, or f of 2, you will always get 0 as your answer because these are the zeros of the function. Now, because of that, what I can do is this. I can already say that I know my x-intercepts are here, back here at negative 9, and here at positive 2. And this gives me a little bit of information about the graph. Okay? And I happen to know, because the leading coefficient is positive, cubics tend to rise. And the way it will look it will be like this. Okay? And you'll learn more about this in pre-calc. Soon you're going to realize that you don't need a graphing calculator ever again. Okay? If you know enough about it, once you learn calculus and pre-calc, you don't need to graph with a graphing calculator. You can do it all in your head. Okay? And granted, you'll write some stuff down, obviously, but you don't need to make a table of values or anything. Okay, just because of the information you can talk about, once you learn calculus, you can talk about how to figure out if it's increasing or if it's decreasing. You could find these maxes and these mins using calculus. So you'll learn a lot more, but this first thing we did here, finding the zeros of a function or the roots, is the first step you need to have to do it. Okay? So again, what we're doing for the second half of today, or this, sorry, the second half of this lesson today, is finding the zeros of the function or the x-intercepts of the function but it's the same exact process as yesterday's lesson, okay? If anything, it's actually easier because all you do is set f of x equal to zero and then go ahead and solve the resulting polynomial. So now let's go on to the next example. <clears throat> this is no more difficult, but this is similar to the one that you guys asked about, 27 over here for the homework because we have one of our factors that's repeated, right? So it's the same idea. So again, if we want to find the zeros, we set the function equal to zero and just start by writing it out. Now watch what I'm going to do. You don't have to do this, by the way, but I'm just going to do this so you can see what's going on here, really. Okay, everybody agree that that's what's really happening? X minus 1, or sorry, K. K minus 1 occurs twice. K plus 2 occurs three times. K occurs once. So that's physically what this equation represents. You do not need to list them out every time. It's just redundant, right? You can simply write them out. But what I want you to notice is this. You're going to have some double and triple roots here. That's the key. And without necessarily listing them out, some students forget that the fact that k minus 1 is squared in indicates that you'll have a double root. k plus 2 is cubed is indicative of the fact that you're going to have a triple root. Okay, Arthur. So on the test, is it going to be, are you going to ask, like, is this a double root? So here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to list your solution like this. So first of all, we would set all of these equal to zero, right? We'd set them each equal to zero. k equals zero, k minus one equals zero, which gives us k equals one. And we'll pick up on the pattern, obviously. I'm not gonna do it every time. Okay, but we only have three unique solutions. They are zero, one, and negative two. But again, this is a double root, and this is a triple root. Now, what you need to know is what it looks like on the graph, and that's what I'm going to talk about now, okay? So yes, Arthur, you should, in your own sense, indicate that you have a double or triple root, because I'm going to follow this question up with something like, what does the graph look like around, and this would be x instead of k, but x equals 1. And you have to say, well, around x equals 1, we have a double root, and therefore, and I'll talk about now what it looks like, okay? So that's the kind of process you'll go through. George. Uh, Mm -hmm. No, it's the next test. Monday's test, we're just talking about it. Oh, there's a test on Monday. 
Now, on a graph, one sec, Summer, I see your hand. On a graph, here's what I want you to notice. Actually, I think I have an image of this saved. I think I do. Let me pull this up. I do. Perfect. All right, here we go. This is the graph of what you just saw. Okay? Oh, hold on. Let me change the color then. It's really not. Or let me just highlight it because I already took a picture of it. Still nothing? Is it better? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to shut the lights off so you can see it much better then. Hold on. Is that better? All right. Now, now, now. Oh, now, now. Right. So, quickly, let's write down what our solution was again. It was k equals negative 2, 0, and 1. At negative 2, we had a triple root. At 1, we had a double root. Agreed? All right. So, here's what's going on. Whenever you have a root, it's where it crosses the x-axis. But the problem is you're going to clearly see that it doesn't cross the x-axis over here, right? It doesn't actually cross. It touches it, but it doesn't cross. So when you have a double or triple root, the behavior of the graph changes. So if you have a normal root, for example here, 0, that's a normal root. It's not a double root. It's not a triple root. And we'll see that it just crosses the axis plainly. But when you have a double root, here's what happens. It goes toward the axis like it's going to cross it, and it wants to continue this way. But the double root indicates that there's going to be what's called a tangent here. And a tangent is when the curve touches the axis once and comes back around. So when you see that there's a little tangent when it's going toward the axis, like it's going to cross, and then it just touches it, but then it comes back around, it's not actually, I'm not going down below and coming back up. It's literally touching the axis right there and then turning back around. It's not actually crossing. This is called a point of tangency. You can write this down. Okay, a point of tangency. We could say that the curve is tangent to the x-axis. The curve, and guys, you can sketch this, by the way, for those of you that are looking on right now. Just draw a quick sketch. Draw this loop here, come through, and then just draw, come back around so you can see it. Georgia. I'm sorry, what does the TRDR stand for? Triple root, double root. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. So here we could say, again, in words, if we wanted to say something for this location we're talking about now, we could say that the curve is tangent to the x axis at a double root. Again. The curve is tangent to the x-axis at a double root. And you're going to learn more about tangents in geometry when you talk about circles and lines that only touch a circle once on the outside. Okay, that's, called a, that's where you've probably heard it before. And I'll draw that in red in the upper right over here to show you what I mean. If you had a circle here and there was a line that came through and only touched once, that was a bad example and only touched once right there, that would be called a point of tangency on a circle. And if you've seen this before, it might ring a bell the word tangent. If not, don't worry, because next year in geometry, you're going to study this anyhow. Okay, but this is a point of tangency because the circle only touches that line once. I drew a terrible example, so I'm just going to try and widen that circle to make it look better. Okay? Um, but on a graph, a point of tangency is when a curve simply touches it and then comes back around. Okay, again, single root, it crosses. What about this triple root? What's the deal there? Who could describe what that looks like to them? It's a little bit weird, I know. Worth, give it a shot. Um, I, I, I can't. You want me to start from tracing up here and you can talk, or should I trace them so, down um, here? Can I give like, an example of what that's like? That's like when you have like flowing water, and as it will come off, the rain will actually just fall off at the same uh, Rain that it went down. That's awesome. That's a great analogy. Think about that. Like a water slide. Here you're coming down the water slide, right? And you're about to go off the end of the water slide and then you get launched off into the pool. That's exactly what that looks like. That's an awesome analogy. Really good. I've never even thought about it that way. We call it a point of inflection in math, but that's exactly what that is. And here's what's happening right here. It looks 
it looks like it's going to be a double root, right? It looks like it's going to be a point of tangency, like it wants to come back around here. Like you can fit a little parabola right here. But as it's coming down, it's about to come back around, but then it says, no, I'm going to keep going. And it curls back around the other way. And if you look at it from the other way, it looks like a point of tangency coming up this way, and it's going to curl back around like that. But in reality, it doesn't curl back around. It stops, and it comes back up this way. Okay, so a water slide is a really good example. But we call this, if you want to write it down, an inflection point. Inflection point. And just so you know, an inflection point indicates that there's a change in the graph's curvature. Look at the curvature, ready? And this is all calculus I'm teaching you right now, okay? This curve here, watch. If you were to follow this path and take a look at it, you would say that if I continued this and made it like a parabola, you would say that the parabola opens up, meaning the curvature points up, like a bucket, right? Or your hand like this. The open part of it points up. So this would be called concave up. But then it starts to turn back around like this. And down here it would be concave down. So this is concave up to here. Then it goes concave down. When there's a change in that concavity or that curvature, that's a point of inflection. Okay, it's a point of inflection. What you should know for algebra 2 is that a double root is a point of tangency and a triple root is a point of inflection. Okay, and to generalize... If you had a quadruple root, it would go back to a point of tangency. If you had a root that repeated itself five times, it would go back to a point of inflection. So even, even amounts of repetition result in points of tangency. Okay, so a double root, a quadruple root, a sextuple root, those all result in points of tangency. But a triple root, a quintuple root, like a five times root, or a septuple root seven times would be a point of inflection. So even repeated amounts is tangency, odd repeated amounts is inflection point. Okay? That's the general idea of what it looks like. David? Well, the triple root actually looks like the graph of um, the cubic. Yes, graph. absolutely. Because think about y equals x to the third. That's it's a triple root at x equals zero, and that's exactly what it's like. Well done. You hear what he's saying there? X to the cube function, simple X to the cube function looks like this. And it's a point of tangency because there's a triple root at X equals zero. Because zero is the only answer you can plug in for X to make the function equal to zero there. You want it to follow up? Look like you're going to say something else. It's also, just so you know and you haven't seen this yet, but if you graph what are called tangent lines and sines and cosines, it looks like one of those also, but not to confuse you with anything, okay? All right, awesome. Let's go on to the next slide now. Determine the zeros of the following. Very easy problem to do. Work on it on your own. Please don't use decimals. Do something right away to make the problem easier, okay? Remember to make it easier on yourself, so do something to both sides of the equation. Multiply it by some factor that will get rid of those decimals for you. Factors? Well, you, then you set them equal to zero, really. and you get the zeros. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And some of you might be using AC method here, which you can. But you could also use trial and error because 2 in the front is prime and 5 at the end is prime, so it makes it a little easier on you. So the number we're multiplying by is 10, right, clearly? Multiply both sides of the equation by 10, but 0 times 10 is still 0.
That's the cool part about finding roots of an equation. You can always multiply it by anything because the zero on the other side doesn't change. Make sure after you get the factors that you go on to find the actual roots of the equation so that you know what the zeros are. Good, good. 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 You're close, you're close. Now, you, if you put the 5 there, right, and you foil, it would be 5 times 2, which gives you a 10 in the middle. But here you want to factor by grouping, right? Right. So I would use grouping here instead. That's what you've been doing with AC method. So remember, put a dash line. Oh, yeah. Remember that whole thing? Yeah. Okay. That's all right. Be careful here because take a look. X times X doesn't give you 2X squared. So this isn't factored correctly, so go back and see what you have to do. Because one of these has to be 2x, right? It's got to be 2x times x to give you 2x squared. So one of these has to be 2x, and then these two numbers right here need to multiply to give you that. So rework your factors and try. Good, I checked yours already. You're good. Good. If you did it with AC method and you're successful, folks, if you did it with AC method and you're successful right now, Please keep trying it, but think about a way you could have done it without AC method. Because you can do this without AC method. Just think about it for a minute, and I'll come back. Now be careful, because see here with the 10 and the 1? There should be an X next to both of them. The 11 should have an X next to both of them. Right, isn't there an X there? So you're going to take out a 2X in the end here, so it's going to change it. So you need an X next to the 10 and the 1. Keep going, come on, solve. You need to find the roots of the equation with the zeros of the function. You're close, but no. Because the 10 and the 1 are not correct. Is 10 times 1 5? No. That's the thing. You always have to check that these two multiply to give you the end. And those don't. That's not part of it. Where did that come from? If you had an X out in front, like right there in that little slot, you would set that X equal to zero. Think about it. What was the highest exponent in the equation? And how many answers do you have? Okay, that was from yesterday. You should make sure you watch that, okay? Good. Very good. Let me see. Yep. Perfect. Now, you can go from here, Ida, down to here in one step. That's what I want you to try and figure out while you're waiting. No, no, I'm saying I want you to practice factoring that kind of a problem without AC method. I just yep. got the wrong answers. I used 10 and 1, and then it didn't work. It's not. No, no, no. Using AC method, 10 and the 1 work with AC method, but those aren't the answers. You're just trying to find the factors, right? Yeah. All right, folks, take a look up here real quick. I want to show you something that some of you have picked up on and others are still working on. Now, AC method always works, okay? AC method, assuming it can be factored, obviously. If something cannot be factored, if it's prime, nothing is going to work. But if something is factorable and you have a non-unity or non-one value in the beginning as a leading coefficient, then AC method will always work. But a 
A problem like this, you don't really need it. And let me explain. Okay, let me explain why. This first term, this 2x squared here, comes from the fact that you have something here and something here to multiply to give you 2x squared. The only thing that multiplies to give you x squared is x times x. But you need a 2 in front, so one of these x's needs to have a 2 in front of it. So right away, those are going to be the beginning part of your factors. Because again, how would you do this? You would FOIL, wouldn't you? First, outer, inner, last. First would be 2x times x, giving you the 2x squared. Next. The next part is to look and say, what things would give you a 5 at the end? That comes from the last part of FOIL. Remember, F-O-I-L. L is last. L from FOIL is when you multiply this times this, and it gives you this. What's the only numbers that can multiply to give you 5? 1 and 5. Or? Negative 1 and negative 5. Yeah. So we have choices now. Here's what we've got. It could either be a 5 here and a 1 here, or it could be a 1 here and a 5 here. And they could either be plus or minus. So I could have a positive 5 and a positive 1. Or a negative 5 and a negative 1. Or a positive 1 here and a positive 5 here. Or a negative 1 here and a negative 5 here. And this seems like it might be tough at first. But what you want to look at is the number in the middle. Negative 11. The only way I'm going to get a negative sum is if I'm adding two negative quantities together here, or a negative and a positive where the negative is larger. So if I chose this and this as my answer, say I did 2x plus 5x plus 1. Well, multiplying the middle terms here would give me 5x. Multiplying the outer terms would give me 2x. And 5x and 2x is 7x, not negative 11x. So off the bat, we know that this is not our answer. It cannot be positive 5, positive 1. Let's try the next one. Negative 5, negative 1. If we multiply the inner terms, we get negative 5. If we multiply the outer terms, we get negative 2. Negative 5 and negative 2 gives me negative 7. Also doesn't work. So that means right away that this cannot be the possible answer. So now we go down to the other possibilities. If I look at positive 1 and positive 5 and multiply them, Where's my marker? Here we go. If I do the inner ones, I'm going to have positive 1 times x is 1x. Then I have a positive 5 times 2 is 10x. So I would have a 10x from the outer and a 1x from the inner giving me 11x. But I don't want 11x. What do I want? Negative. Yeah, I want negative 11x. So the answer is most definitely going to be that last option of 2x minus 1, x minus 5. And let's prove it. First, gives me 2x squared. Outer, gives me negative 10x. Inner, gives me negative 1x. So now I've got a negative 10x and a negative 1x. That's the negative 11x. And then last, negative 5 times negative 1 gives me positive 5. So if you're able to pick up on this, that this leading coefficient is prime, and you could just put its factors here, and the last term, or the constant, is also prime, you only have four possible choices. So you can go through it a little bit quicker. And as you do more of these, sometimes it's easier to do them in your head. Again, AC method definitely works. If you prefer it, stick with it. Okay? But I want you to see that you could do this without AC method. When it's a simple leading coefficient and a simple constant term. It's like, is it okay if you use AC method? There's never going to be a time when you say... No. You're good. Yep, you're absolutely good. It just, again, sometimes some people can do it quicker in their head than by going through the routine of the AC method, which is why I just want to show it because of things like multiple choice. Maybe we could do it real quick. You don't have to show any work. I was just going to say, technically you're still doing the same thing. You're still telling the person that add, uh, multiplies to 5 and adds to 11. Yeah, it's just a different, a different approach. It's like a roundabout approach to it. That's all it is. All right, let's take a look. We have two more to go. Number seven says if f of x, and this should say x to the fourth, not h to the fourth here, because it's f of x, right? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, if f of x equals h to the fourth minus 9h squared, oh, I said h, <laughs> x to the fourth minus 9x squared plus 20, where does f of x cross the x axis? Where does f of x cross the x axis? 
A problem like this seems difficult, but again, we're looking to where it crosses the x-axis, which are the x-intercepts, which are the zeros of the function. So in essence, we're still doing the same thing. We're setting it equal to zero. Now, treat these problems the same way you would treat anything you can factor whenever this exponent is double this exponent. Again, take note. This is a four, so it seems like it's tough, but it's double the middle exponent, isn't it? So this is the same as a quadratic, except that when we factor it, instead of these being x's, what are they going to be? X squared. Very good. Well done. But you factor it the same way. What numbers multiply to 20 and add up to negative 9? Um, negative 4 and negative 5 and negative 5. Very good. Negative 4 times negative 5 multiplies to 20. Negative 4 plus negative 5 adds up to negative 9. Now... What else can you do? Keep going. You can factor this further. You can factor it further. Tori May. Well, the first one is different to the perfect squares. Very good. So that's just x plus 4, x minus 4. 2, 2, sorry. Right, the squares. Yeah. And then the second one is just that's it. Yeah. It's, 5 is not a perfect square. So you could write it as x plus radical 5 and x minus radical 5. Right? Because what's the square root of 4? It was these 2's here. So you could just do the square root of 5 and write it that way, but there's no need to. We're going to see that we're going to have three columns, but this third column is going to give us how many answers? Yeah, it's a double answer here. Not a double root, but we're going to get two answers from it. So here, set the first one equal to 0, giving us x equals negative 2. Set the second one equal to 0, giving us x equals positive 2. Set the third one equal to 0, and we have to do a little work. Add the 5 over, and then square root it. Could you just keep it in the square root? Yeah. Could you just keep the square root? Of Absolutely, yeah. Right here for the radical 5? Sure. When you're graphing, it's good to know what that is approximately as a decimal, though, right? But yes, you can definitely keep it that way. If it was just that, just like So the, the four x-intercepts for this problem would be the following. And make sure you answer the question being asked. If I say what are the zeros, you can just give me the zeros. But if it says the x-intercepts, you need to write coordinates. Okay, those are the four x-intercepts for this problem. Again, negative 2, 2, negative root 5, positive root 5. Do you notice something? Some symmetry here? The x-intercepts are going to be symmetric. The reason is this is called an even function. Don't worry about it too much, but just so you know about symmetry. There's symmetry here in this graph. Okay? These are going to occur on opposite sides of the x-axis, and so are these. Radical 5 is approximately 2, right? Because radical 4 is 2, so radical 5 is like 2.2. Okay, it's around 2.2. So if you were graphing and you were doing anything with graphing, it would be good to know the decimal value. But as far as the x-intercepts are concerned, you can leave it. This one looks like the following. Here's what this one looks like. And take a look. Oops, let me choose it. Take a look. Here's the first root of negative 2. Here's another one of positive 2. Here's the negative around 2.2, .2, which is the radical 5 one. And this is the positive radical 5x intercept. This, believe it or not, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see, this does go through the axis. These are not tangents here. You see how it goes through the axis there? So again, this is the negative 2x intercept. This is the negative radical 5x intercept. Okay? All right. Let's finish the last one. Award me like a minute after the bell, please. We can do this quickly, though. If A and B are constants, then solve the equation for X. So we're back to solving equations. We're finding the roots. First step is to move everything over. So let's take these and just move them over to start. Again, just move everything over. So we just switch the signs and move them over. Okay, just move them over. Tori May, what do you think we should do? Okay, so we can split the two. Like, How did you know that we could do that? Because I see How that many terms? there's four terms, and there is common terms on both sides, so you can just leave it like that. Well done. And then do you want to Yeah, keep going. Okay, and then you can take out the x on the first side, and you get x plus a. 
and then you take out the I want x plus a, so I take yeah. out. So you take out the negative b. Yeah, the negative b. Be careful here. Negative b has to come out of there. Keep going. And then you, uh, then it's just x minus b, or x minus a equals 0. And then you set both of those to 0, and you solve. Very good. So this is factoring by grouping. So x equals b and x equals negative a are the answers or the solutions to this equation. Okay, a different kind of example because there's no numbers. Now, make sure tonight you need to finish up the homework. You should have already done 3 through 27. So you have to finish up these portions. Please, please start your problem set if you haven't done so already also. Hey, remember, to do on Friday. We need to get going on those. We have class tomorrow, we have class on Thursday, and then they're due on Friday.